Well, here we are to our second lecture of Module 4, and we're talking about how cells are organized. And we've already introduced some of these concepts. I've already mentioned in the past the two major types of cells in all living organisms. We have, of course, our prokaryotes, our prokaryotic cells, and our eukaryotes, meaning true cell, uh, true seed, excuse me. So prokaryotes, you know, as you can see, thought to be the first cells to evolve. They lack a nucleus. They're represented by bacteria and archaea, which we, once again we mentioned in the very first module. Uh, you will sometimes hear bacteria associated with what was called Kingdom Mulnera. So another term you might hear a bit. So with prokaryotes, you have to remember that these are always unicellular organisms. So uni meaning, of course, one. So one cell, one cell organisms. And once again, they have no <clears throat> membrane-bound organelles. They do have a cell membrane, that outer membrane that we've talked about that's made up primarily of that phospholipid bilayer, cell membrane slash plasma membrane. So they do have a plasma membrane, but inside it they have no membrane-bound organelles. They have no true nucleus. So all their genetic information is contained, once again, it's in DNA, but it's a circular mo molecule of DNA right here in what's known as the nucleoid region. So it's not bound by anything. Whereas eukaryotic cells, they ha also have a plasma membrane, so they have that in common. But So I'm going to make this a little more squiggly here, DNA. But its DNA is in a membrane-bound nucleus. Okay, So there's my DNA in the nucleus, its own membrane. And once again, it's a membrane, it's going to be that phospholipid bilayer. So I just try and point out some of the differences, and we're going to go in more detail in a second. But once again, the eukaryotic cells, once again, has a nucleus that houses the DNA and also has many, many, many membrane-bound organelles. So there are lots of little organelles in here that are going to be membrane-bound. Where I find kind of a big one known as the mitochondria, which is going to be our main energy producer. So eukaryotic cells are going to look more like this, while prokaryotic cells relatively are, are much simpler. So they, they only contain, once again, their, their DNA is a single circular molecule of DNA in that nuclear region. They may also contain what's called, known as plasmids, which are smaller rings of DNA that replicate separately. And those would just have a few genes that may help the cell survive in adverse conditions, but its main DNA is just a single piece of DNA in that nucleoid region. So here's a picture, uh, not my, not the best pictures, sorry, but here once again we have that prokaryotic cell and it has that outer membrane, that plasma membrane, because once again that's going to be the same for both. And here's that DNA, it's kind of this globo DNA that's kind of just loose in the cytosol, the fluid component of this whole thing is called the cytoplasm. So. Uh, the cytoplasm is the, the fluid component along with all the organelles and what have you. So here is, once again, the DNA in the nucleoid region, my plasma membrane. In this case, it does have a what's known as a cell wall. should be around it as well to help protect it. And it still has ribosomes just flowing freely in there because we need that for protein production. All right? Now we go and look at the eukaryotic cell. Once again, we're bounded by a cell membrane, but once again, it's filled with that cytoplasm which contains those organelles of specialized form and function. And once again, it's, so everything on the inside, kind of outside the nucleus, all this part right here, this is all known as cytoplasm. And so the organelles within the cytoplasm each have their, their own name and the fluid part of the cytoplasm is known as cytosol. 
in this case, in the nucleus, all the genetic uh, material is, are linear strands of DNA organized into a term that you know, chromosomes. So linear DNA um, and organized into chromosomes located within the nucleus. Plant cells will have these chloroplasts, uh, but they're not going to have centrioles. We'll get to that later. So we can tell this is a plant cell because it has chloroplasts. So as a quick summary, we're taking these two different types of cells and just saying, hey, what's the same? What's different and what's the same? As far as what they have in common, they have that plasma membrane. They always are going to be bound by that phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins throughout it. All right, and that's what's going to delineate the cell. That's what's going to define the outer boundary of the cell. Both of them are going to have that cytoplasm, which once again is that semi-fluid portion inside the cell, and that's what contains the organelles. The actual fluid portion, again, is known as the specifically cytosol. I know I already wrote that down, but I thought one more time would be good. And of course, it's going to have DNA, because once again, DNA is what's going to define it, define its traits, and be the template for all the proteins we need to make. So here's an actual electron micrograph. Um, so uh, the electron uh, microscopes that we talked about earlier of, a, of an actual cell. And we can see we have the plasma membrane that is defining the outer aspect of the cell here, right? The outer element. And then we have this big nucleus in the middle, which is defined itself by its own phospholipid bilayer known as the nuclear envelope. You will often hear nuclear envelope, nuclear membrane used interchangeably. All right. Here is the nucleolus, and this is where ribosomal RNA is going to be made. We will definitely get back to the nucleolus. Once again, that's where our RNA, ribosomal RNA, we'll get to that a little bit later, is made. Uh, and then there's chromatin, endoplasmic reticulum. Once again, we're going to get into all these details about all these different components of the cell. What I want you to see right now is that from structurally, eukaryotic cells are much more complex. Let's take a different picture. Here's an artist rendering, and let's look at everything that's going on here. And these are things that you are going to have to know and understand. So we have, once again, zooming in at the very top, we've got our plasma membrane, right? And we see there's that phospholipid bilayer that we've seen before, and there's that protein that's the integral protein that's going through it. So, we, so it's facing both the outside and the inside of the cell. We're also going to find out we have what's called cytoskeleton. So yes, it's not just all fluid in here. We actually have like this uh, protein framework, which is going to help define the cell and assist in movement of different elements throughout the cell. So think of it both as like a, a scaffolding, but also a freeway system to move things around within the cell. Specifically, we have what's known as microtubules which are cylinders of protein molecules that are going to be present in cytoplasm, centriole, cilia, and flagella. They're going to be very important as far as movement and reproduction. Intermediate filaments, once again, are more protein fibers that provide um, support and strength. And notice we see a lot of protein. I've already told you, protein is the workhorse in the cell. Even the cytoskeleton, primarily protein. Actin filaments. We're going to learn about, a lot about actin when we talk about muscle contraction. But these protein specialized protein fibers are in all eukaryotic cells, and that and they play the role in movement of the cell and its organelles. So once again, here's another specialized protein for movement. Centrioles um, are short cylinders of microtubules. So another once again cylinders of protein. Once again, they're important in reproduction of the cell. Centrosome. Microtubules organizing the center and contains the centrioles. Once again, when we get to cellular um, replication, let's put it that way, then re rather than reproduction, cellular replication, we're going to be talking about these guys. Uh, vesicles, important here. Once again, membrane bound. So there's that phospholipid bilayer right here. Here's an example that stores and supports substances. So when things go in and out of the cell, Okay, they are often encased in these vesicles, little membrane-bound organelles. And notice right here what's going on. Do you see this? I'm going to call it an invagination right here going on at the cell. 
Right now, this might be something that the cell's taking in from the outside and it's going to bring it in and make it turn it into a vesicle. But actually, what's happening, uh, um, now that I'm looking at the picture better, this is a protein that's been made that has been transcribed and translated uh, from our DNA. It goes out here and is being packaged and being released to the outside. That's called exocytosis. And once again, we're going to spend some time about how does the cell communicate with its outside environment and take in nutrients and have and also expel waste or expel other uh, things that it produces. We're going to find out that's called endocytosis and exocytosis. I know I'm going kind of quick, going into much more detail later. Cytoplasm, once again, just that, just that fluid region, semi-fluid region that contains all the organelles. Here's my nucleus once again with my nuclear envelope, that double membrane with specialized pores. See how there's these pores in it? And that's what's going to allow the RNA that has been, um, <clears throat> excuse me, transcribed in here to come out and then proteins are going to be made from that. So these nuclear pores are going to be important. Chromatin are just a few threads of DNA. They're going to come together to make uh, chromosomes later. Nucleolus, I already mentioned, kind of that thick region inside the nucleus that's going to produce rRNA for ribosomes. rRNA is the RNA that makes up ribosomes. Whoops. Do this. Let's do this again. Endoplasmic reticulum is also going to be used partially with the um, with that translation process. The rough ER is going to have ribosomes on it. That's what makes it rough. Smooth ER does not have ribosomes. So you see these little dots. They represent ribosomes, and that's where protein translation takes place. Smooth ER doesn't have ribosomes. They synthesize lipids. Oh, there's, once again, another one of my big ticket uh, organic molecules that we're going to see again and again and again. So it's not all about proteins. Got lipids there. And once again, ribosomes carry out protein synthesis. Mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Whenever you hear cellular respiration, we think about making energy. Making energy for the cell. And that energy will be in the form of ATP. Oh, there's another nucleic acid. So we have polyribosomes. We have Golgi apparatus uh, here. Uh, processes, packages, and secretes modified cell project, uh, products. So we're going to think of this almost like the post office. So it's going to package things up and send it in the right direction. Now, I just went really fast over this picture, and I'm completely aware of that fact. I didn't really go into any serious detail. I just want to be clear right now that, um, that I'm just introducing these concepts. You will need to know the detail, but right now I just wanted to introduce the names. Right now, for, for the, right now we're just introducing names and concepts. Next week, we're going to go a lot more detailed into each one of these various components of the eukaryotic cell. So where did these eukaryotic cells come from? Well, modern theory is they came from those simpler prokaryotic cells. And basically what would happen is one cell would engulf another cell. You would have a cell that gains a nucleus by, uh, by the plasma membrane invaginating and surrounding the DNA with a double membrane. So basically one cell kind of envelops and, and engulfs another. Uh, cell gains an endomembrane system by proliferation of the membrane. And same idea here is that a bigger cell engulfs a what will eventually be mitochondrion. And it could be, it shows example here where animal cells have mitochondria for energy, while plant cells have chloroplasts to actually get energy from sunlight. So here's a quick little animation from your book, from the publisher, that goes over the theory on how modern eukaryotic cells evolved from prokaryotic cells. The eukaryotic internal membrane system, called the endoplasmic reticulum, and the nuclear envelope may have evolved from infoldings of the plasma membrane in an ancestral prokaryotic cell. Such infoldings are common in modern prokaryotic cells. The theory of endosymbiosis 
proposes that a critical stage in the evolution of eukaryotic cells involved endosymbiotic relationships with prokaryotic organisms. Microorganisms that live within other cells and perform specific functions for their host cells are called endosymbionts. According to the theory, energy-producing bacteria may have been engulfed by a larger primitive cell and come to reside within it, eventually evolving into what we now know as mitochondria. Photosynthetic bacteria use photosynthetic pigments embedded in internal membranes to derive energy from sunlight. These bacteria may have come to live within early eukaryotic cells, leading to the evolution of chloroplasts. Several facts provide evidence for the endosymbiotic hypothesis. A few examples include 1. Mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own circular DNA, similar to DNA in bacteria. 2. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts are surrounded by two membranes. The inner membrane is probably evolved from the plasma membrane of the engulfed prokaryote, while the outer membrane is probably derived from the cell membrane of the host. 3. Mitochondria are about the same size as bacteria. 4. Mitochondria appear to have been derived from purple bacteria and chloroplasts derived from photosynthetic bacteria. Well, obviously, that took a long time to happen. And to put that in perspective, let's move on to the actually the next slide. Where we have another little video from the publisher. Geological and astronomical evidence indicates that the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. To understand the immense span of time represented by 4.6 billion years, and to visualize the timing of major events in Earth history, we can compress all of Earth history into a single year. In this scheme, the Earth forms at midnight on January 1st, and the present is the end of the last second on the night of December 31st. We will represent the geological year as a pie chart calendar divided into 12 months. The Earth and the rest of the solar system condense from the gas of an interstellar nebula on the first day of the year. Shortly after the initial formation of the Earth, the Moon is formed from a collision between the Earth and a Mars-sized planet. For over 400 million years, from January until the end of February, the Earth was cooling while it was subjected to pulses of meteorite bombardment. During this interval, the crust, atmosphere, and oceans may have cooled and condensed several times, only to be remelted and vaporized during large impact events. The oldest surviving rock formations on Earth date to mid-March, almost four billion years ago. The age of the origin of life is not yet known with certainty, but Earth's earliest life forms appear to have evolved between mid-March and early April on our geological calendar. For more than half of the age of the Earth, the most complex life forms on the Earth were bacteria. Geological evidence indicates that large continental land masses existed by mid-June, around 2.5 billion years ago. The first fossil evidence of larger, more complex eukaryotic algae is found in rock layers that date to mid-July. The first fossils of large multicellular animals are not found until early November just over 600 million years ago. The oldest known fossils of animals capable of making shells, such as clams, brachiopods, and trilobites, first appear in the rock record in late November, just over 500 million years ago. Along with the first shelly animals appear the first fish-like vertebrates, which continue to evolve to the present. Many important events in vertebrate evolution and geological history occur in the month of December. Lungfish evolve limbs and begin their transition to life on land as amphibians on December 2nd. Vast coal deposits form in swamps that cover the lowlands of North America and Europe as the first reptiles evolve. By mid-December, the continents have drifted together to form the supercontinent, Pangaea. This event coincides with the largest mass extinction in Earth history 
on December 12th. Dinosaurs begin their 160 million year reign on December 13th and do not go extinct until the evening of December 26th. Birds evolved from dinosaurs at some point in mid-December. While the dinosaurs rule the earth, the continents are being carried by plate motions into their modern positions. Although mammals first evolved before the dinosaurs in early December, they do not become the dominant terrestrial animals until after the dinosaurs go extinct in the last four days of December. The end of December is also witness to the formation of the Earth's current high mountain ranges. The story of human evolution unfolds on the last day of the geological year. Fossils reveal that the first upright walking human ancestors, or hominids, evolved around four million years ago at about four o'clock on December 31st. The first major migration of hominids out of Africa does not occur until 10 p.m., about one million years ago. The first anatomically modern humans appear in the fossil record at about 12 minutes to midnight. Agriculture develops 10,000 years ago in Mesopotamia at one minute to midnight. The Roman Empire lasts for 15 seconds. And Columbus sets sail at three seconds to midnight during the last minute of the geological year. The first geologists begin to decipher the history of the Earth in the late 1700s and spend the last seconds studying the events of the previous 31,536,000 seconds of the geological year. So hopefully that puts everything into a little bit different perspective for you, or a better perspective on how life came about. And in the next lecture, we're going to go really in-depth into one of my favorite topics, as you can probably tell by this point, that plasma membrane and how things cross it.